Right ahead. Well, joining us for this Easter spectacular is Lauren Belcross, former Labour advisor, and Adam Stott, who is an entrepreneur and business coach. Good morning, happy Easter. Good morning. Good morning. How are you both? Super. Fabulous. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, good answer. Good answer. And also, I love the colours. Bright, colourful Easter. I thought I'd make the effort for today, David. <laughs> I've you... never seen you so dressed down, actually. <laughs> I don't think That's... he's getting ready for the army. Oh, oh, you've got your beard ready. Right, um, let's talk about um, the election. Um, lots of people are talking about when this election is. I actually had a lot of messages coming in yesterday about this and Rishi Sunak. There's a lot to unpick here. But the front page of The Telegraph this morning, I just think is really interesting. I have constantly said immigration is going to be number one in this election because everything comes off that. But um, the big plan from the Conservatives, as we know, they haven't got immigration under control. We're now at, what, 4,644, I think, this year. Um, what, why? Don't say that. Just look at last year. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so we already have that number coming to this country, even though the illegal migration bill has gone through, and all these people are stuck in a state of limbo. We're waiting for the safety of Rwanda bill. But this is the Tory plan. So, and and there might be some merit in it. The migrant nationalities with the highest rates of crime will be revealed in league tables under plans to be considered by ministers. Now, the proposal, which is backed by senior Tory MPs, would require, would require the crime rates of each nation's migrants in England and Wales to be published annually. And then ministers have to present a report to Parliament each year detailing the nationality, visa status and asylum status of every offender convicted in England and Welsh courts in the previous 12 months. Now, such a move would mirror an approach by some US states and Denmark. And what they found in Denmark was the crime rates of those from Kuwait, Tunisia, Lebanon and Somalia are far higher than those of Danish nationals. This would come in an amendment to the government's criminal justice bill. Hmm, Lauren, um, as a former advisor, it seems to me this doesn't really... Ta whilst I understand the data is important, does this really tackle the issue, which is I think we already know where the trouble is coming from. If you are an illegal in this country, you need to be deported. Isn't that the issue? I think this is has the potential to be one of these issues where, as with so many of the government's approaches to migration, they are chasing the headline, not the detail. Um, it's all well and good, as you say, Denmark do this. I can be sympathetic to the government and say, actually, we've seen previously there was an issue with Albania. Indeed. And Alba Albanians committing crime in this country. We've then signed an agreement with Albania to address this specific issue. If that can be replicated with other nationalities and fair enough let's you know potentially worth exploring but i don't have the confidence in this government's ability to do it because as with the rwanda plan which let's be honest none of us think that any single plane is going to take off taking any single person to rwanda doesn't mean we don't want there to be a plane taking off but i think it's I, mean, I prefer Keir Starmer and the Labour Party's plans to deal with this. So I think what, but what exactly are those? Of because tackling the gangs at source. Of, oh, come no, on. David, everyone, I'm sorry. Everyone I'm sorry. says that. No, come but on. I think there is a better approach of taking a slightly more boring, slightly more detailed issue as opposed to chasing headlines that aren't mm. going to get you anywhere and then are only going to get you disappointment because, as we see, we've been discussing this issue for, what, two years now and not a single plane take off. Okay. And no one thinks a plane's going to take off. Do you think that would be as successful as tackling the drug gangs? I think there's more scope for it and I think there's more willingness to cooperate. Okay. Exactly, and I think we should be. Uh, let me just ask Adam here. Uh, this is clearly a pressing issue for people sitting at home, but actually, to be fair to the government, they have tried lots yeah, of things. I, I, £150 million pounds into the Frontex thing, £500 million pounds they've spent here there and everywhere helping france yeah. and so on I, so they are trying and i think actually i think this plan isn't a bad plan because i think what's monitored and what is measured is easier to improve and basically what we're saying is we're not monitoring we're not measuring they're saying they've got the information but they're keeping mm. the information to themselves i think actually making this information public i think that if they were to monitor and measure it we can actually start to control it better and i think it is a good step in the right direction it's worked in denmark worked in some states in america so i think it's actually a really positive step forward my my, my only concern would be to add to that is then how are the actions taken mm. after we get the data so get the data take the actions mm. and, and, and where do you stand on on the safety of rwanda bill because obviously we're now at an impasse it's the easter break and i think the members of parliament are sitting there and scheming and plotting and i also wonder actually this was put forward by robert jenrick uh, the former immigration minister how much of this is and I take your point about the front page. How much of this is also ministers on manoeuvre? Because I think they can sense Rishi Sunak is a very weak leader indeed. 
Well, I think that there is obviously, you know, a sh there's struggles. Um, but I think the, the fact of the matter is when you put a plan in place, you've got to see the plan through. You've got to take the actions to get it done. And, and I think that uh, that is what they're doing. And we say he's a weak leader, but he is still pushing through. He sets out his agenda and he then pushes through to get the agenda finished. And when you talk about, oh, we're going to stop the ganks, there is no plan. It's always no plan. With Labour, there is no plan. There is no detail how we're going to move towards I mean, it this. is very yeah. easy to say, it's, Lauren, it's just, isn't it's it? Just I'm going to talk to yeah. people. I'm going to stop the gangs. Because he's in opposition. He doesn't have the power to make those decisions. It, it, he's, it. Set, he's sketching out his plans of what he wants to do. And it's all one and good to say, well, he's got a plan, he's pushing for it. But he's not delivered well, on well, it. And, well, you let, know, let there's been so many years well, well, of headline chasing. Let, let me just ask you about that, because it is something that comes up constantly about Keir Starmer, because obviously the poll lead is extraordinary, whether you can read into the polls. And of course, you've got John Curtis saying there's a 99% chance of Labour getting in. I said earlier on, Labour actually, what they have to do tactically, and you know more than me, but they have to actually do nothing, or at least not commit any big <laughs> massive muck-ups. <laughs> well, they need to do nothing at the moment, and, and let the Conservatives make all the mistakes. However, I just wonder, as this comes nearer to the election, when, when does Labour, and you will know this as a former advisor, when does Labour have to be up front with the public and say, right, this is our manifesto, these are our commitments, and this is what we will deliver for the British people. What I will say is I think there's no, com even though John Curtis says 99% of the poll, 99% certainty that Labour will win the next election, I think nobody in Keir Starmer's office, especially Keir Starmer, is going to take that for granted in any moment. I think everyone remembers, it's burned into their consciousness, Kinnock in 92, of everyone assuming and asserting that he would win and John Major winning. So I think everyone has got that fear and the lack of complacency and wants to be delivering the election without sort of assuming it's in the bag. On the questions of substance and when it's their plans, I think that you're starting to see that. You had the issue with 28 billion and it took a while for them to make a decision on it, but they said, and were open and honest, and said, look, there isn't the money to do what we wanted to do, our great ambitions plan. We'd rather be honest and open with you and say, look, we can't do this. We're going to have to reduce this figure. Or did they read the people who don't I've, want I've to I think they're always, always trying to read the people. The only plans that they have come out with any detail, the plans are horrendous, like the employment plan, what they try, plan to destroy business owners, basically, by giving massive amounts of power. There, there's some detail I want to talk that, about that. And it, and it looks dangerous, right, for a business owner. That's so so, so just, just in terms, Adam, where we are, you, you seem to be sticking up for Rishi Sunak. Look, it's a pretty miserable job yeah. right now. Um, but there, there is, um, and you've got Half and haven't you, and, and you You've got other MPs all standing down, and we're now at 63, I think. Which, which is, to illustrate that, that is one in five, almost, of cons all si current sitting Conservative it, MPs. Indeed. That's huge. We're still not at 97 when there were 75, but we're, we're not far off that. But Halfen, Halfen's resignation letter was really interesting. He was a staunch loyalist of Sunag and well-liked minister. He then turned to Lord of, Lord of the Rings for inspiration when he <laughs> announced he was standing down, which I found very odd. He said he was reminded of the words of the wizard Gandalf after the hobbits had defeated evil and were returning home. I'm not coming to the Shire, my time is over, and as for you, my dear friends, you will need no help. Among the great you are, I, ha I no longer fear for uh, at all for any of you. Uh, now, it is interesting that the MPs are reading the runes, I think, here. And many people are saying, look, Rishi Sunak is going to face obliteration particularly, depending on what happens in the local elections on the 2nd of May. What do you think is about to unravel? I think that, yeah, he's under massive pressure. I, I think that he, we all, it's clear he's losing. But things do change fast, and, and you never know what's going to happen in, in the political landscape. There's a lot of things going on in the world. You know, for example, things like, you know, looming war and issues like that. You know, and, and all Labour seem to care about is is things like em employee health and not actually defence and different things like that. So who knows what is going to happen at this well, stage? Well, you say that, yeah. but let me just throw this back to you. These are the latest polls. When you look at Labour, they are more trusted now on the economy, cutting taxes for working people, on Do stopping... Do you know why they're more trusted, though? They're more trusted because... All the, the the amount of criticism that's been thrown, and I think it is it's it's historic as well. It's not just Rishi Sunak; he's inherited a very difficult you know party to I try and bring together that. and manage. And the confidence has been lost over many years, not actually in the role that he's doing. I think he has had a bit of an unfair shake. But no, on no some one of forced things. him to take the job of mm. prime minister. He yeah. volunteered himself to it, and he was enthusiastic he about it. Well, I think well, he exactly. did more than that. I think, <laughs> I think there was a lot.
lot of backstabbing going yeah. on yeah. as well. But also, just Lauren, just in terms of those five points that he set out, he has hoisted himself by his own petard. He set out five things to ju you judge me by these five things. Well, you didn't yeah. do them, did <laughs> People you? will. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think um, I, I like that Halfon used uh, quotes from Lord of the Rings in his <laughs> resignation. It, oh, really it really endeared <laughs> him to me. Um, I also think he's a very big loss for Sunak. He's the sort of minister who doesn't seek the limelight and gets on with the job and is a very, you know, cross, uh, from a Labour point of view, I can say he's actually a very good minister and has tried to do his best in his brief. I think I was in Parliament at the time of Theresa May and the sort of grimness there and... You know, even to the point where in the European elections in 2019, mm. uh, they were on single digits. I think they got around eight or nine percent of the vote when the Brexit party then won the vote um, in that election. I may remember. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but I think the mood now among the Conservatives is worse than it was then, because even then there was a mood of, OK, well, we can do something to change. There mm. is something we can do. I feel so yeah. many of them as the one in five who are now quitting, they feel they are out of road and they feel that some of them, I think some of them even genuinely believe that they deserve to lose the next election because I, of their failures. I, I think the mood is very sombre indeed. There are 2,600 English council seats up for grabs. So the question is, come, let's say the Tories are obliterated in the local elections. Rishi Sunak has two options, doesn't he, really? Does he, does he say, right, my time is up, or does he push the nuclear button and go to the country? I don't think that he's going to say his time's up. I think he's going to keep pushing on. And I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think What some... happens if there are then 53 letters of no confidence? I think he'll, I think he'll go to a, a general election. <laughs> I think he will, because I, I, what I think is, is that this Conservative Party has continually not had uh, leadership and backbiting and issues and all this different stuff going on. Uh. And I think Rishi Sunak will see it out and I think he will push on. Whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing, you need a leader. You need a leader that's going to stand up to criticism. But, you know, he's not a conservative yeah. leader. Yeah. Yeah. But, Rennie, what would you do if you were Sunak? If, if you had the letters of no confidence... In, and then you who's have to who's resign, who's or you go to the country. What would you I do? I think he's going to go to the country. Yeah. I think that's what he would do. The problem you'd then have is you've got quite a lot of Conservative MPs who are likely to lose their jobs. Yes, wanting the uh, the payday for an extra few months. Yeah, I think for in terms of the local elections, I think London they. Pre the Oxbridge by-election, there was talk of, oh, maybe we can still salvage London because of Sadiq's unpopularity. I think the two big markers are, for this set mm. of local elections are going to be West Midlands, Andy Street. Yep. If they lose that, you know, Andy Street has done a very job in, you know, maintaining what is traditionally a Labour area and turning that blue. If they lose that, they are in serious trouble, and I think the pressure on Sunak to quit will be huge. I agree totally. Interestingly, all the Conservative advisers are ditching Rishi Sunak. They're going to Starmer and starting to brief Starmer as well. And they can obviously, or at least they believe they know where where the money will be. You've got people like Marina Wheeler, Boris Johnson's former wife, the leading barrister. She's giving advice to Sir Keir Starmer's party. You've got Mark Carney. Well, then, no surprise there. Lord Cooper, Tom Fletcher, also giving advice to Starmer. Just before the break, and I have to have to give you a right of reply, is there any way that Sunak can turn this around, or is he personally toast? I, th I think he's going to really struggle with turning it around. I think that that is obvious, but I think he's going to carry on and do his very best in, in his leadership effort. You should be now, a politician. Yeah, now, no, the, the reality <laughs> is he what he might need is a is a small miracle, something to happen in the what landscape. Miracle? Well, who, who knows what that small miracle could be, but he might need something that can really swing confidence. What is the one way. thing he... So, just that, that final point, what, what could save him? Is there something... You know so, what, for example, say, is there a Thatcher moment? Do, is do, there... Is do you know what I think is 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 also communicating um, to to groups of people is is an important thing, and I do think too late. Uh, well, it yeah. perhaps is too late, but I do think that the the for uh, the Labour government for business owners is a dangerous thing. I do, and I think that that being highlighted, more business owners should really look. But to, more and more to business be owners are now going to labour. No, you know, okay, big business. Yeah. Not okay, small. so, yeah. so yeah. let's call small business. Right, owners. okay. Well, I'm pick, talking small business. All right, let's pick owners, this up yeah. after the break. I yeah. want to pick this up because it's a really important point mm. that you you mentioned. It's five point six million. Yeah. Do people have the right to switch off from work? And I'm going to ask that question after this break. Stay exactly where you are. This is Talk TV. <laughs>
Welcome back to Week on Breakfast. Time 8.48. Very quickly, lots of you getting in contact, and I just want to uh, mess uh, read out some of these messages. Uh, Anne says, David, I think Rishi will be relying on another manufactured war. Uh, David Mitch says, this is to your point, Lauren, uh, Keir Starmer will have no more success in smashing international people trafficking gangs than the governments and law enforcement agencies around the world have had in smashing international drug trafficking Gangs, the lucrative trade will only end when the pull factor is removed by commitment uh, to in uh, in this country. So essentially, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, doctors says Jenny, why do all Labour MPs and supporters talk in word salad? And that's to you. <laughs> we want detail. We want this is Jenny. We want detailed policies from Labour, not word salad. Well said, Jenny. Well said. <coughs> um, and Ron says Labour were in power for 13 years. I can't remember them stopping the drug gangs because there was always a market. There's only one way to stop the gangs. Term back the boats. I will say there was uh, different levels of scale and actually they did, you know, when there was the issue of people coming over on the tunnels and uh, on backs of lorries, it was dealt with a lot more successfully than it, the current boat issue was. Okay. All right. I'll well, let, I'll, I'll, I'll let you get away with We're that. seeing the same numbers now that we okay. were under Labour. So, so, well, so, let, so let's say we are preparing for a Labour government, OK? And many people, I've just got one here, actually. Uh, we are just buying a home in Spain as we prepare for five years of accelerated decline under Labour. <laughs> Labour's front bench <laughs> leadership wouldn't get a job on the board of any business. Most of them didn't have any real jobs beca beca before they became MPs. It's time to plan a future outside this Isn't country. Isn't Spain a socialist-led country? <laughs> so interesting choice of... Uh, it's, well, it's, it's, actually, Spain is only a socialist-led country because the people voted for a right-wing um, government and they all got together to make sure that they couldn't take power. Well, there you are. Oh. But also, <laughs> well, and also Spain has a very interesting history anyway. It does. Because I remember <laughs> when he was under Franco as well. Um, so Labour, Adam, let me... Uh, you mentioned this, and I think it's a really important point. Labour has softened key policies in its overhaul of workers' rights in response to business fears about the cost impact of their plans. Now, you mentioned this. He's planning the most extensive overhaul of workers' rights in a generation, including cracking down on zero-hours contracts and giving employees enhanced protections from day one in a Job. As Rene says, businesses have expressed fears the measures will raise costs, increase pressure and hamper the economic recovery. Now, one of the things that caught my eye this morning is this right to disconnect through which employees would have been entitled not to be contacted by their bosses outside their working hours. Workers, they say, will have a new right to disconnect from work outside working hours and not be contacted by their employer outside work working hours as a businessman mm -hmm. and an entrepreneur what do you make of that well the whole thing i think is uh, dangerous and, and and worrying i think when you zone in and focus on specific policies that, that can help wh where does this become a priority i don't understand how this is a, a priority of the labor government i think we're already in a in a society where people are being encouraged and uh, the, the working the working mentality the work ethic has been declining mm -hmm. you know it's declined massively since since covid people with the working from home now people apply for jobs when they apply for jobs they say do i have to come in Oh, uh, can I work from home? Like, we've already got all of this stuff going it's a on. Point. It's, it's madness. It is literally madness for an employer that when we now go to recruit <laughs> and we are building a business, people go, oh, do, do, do you want me there? Uh, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I do want it. Oh, and I do want more money, but no, 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 I don't want to come in. Like, you have got some <laughs> mental stuff going on. And then they, Labour come in and go, oh, also give them the right to disconnect. Or give them this and give them that. It no, is think, absolute look, madness. When Labour first came in, it, it, most recently in 97... But why is this an area said, of concern? Let him, let him yeah. All businesses said, oh, these, these crazy ideas like the minimum wage are going to ruin businesses. It's going to be so terrible. Now it's a right. It's accepted and it didn't ruin business. But I'll tell you what, anything. minimum wage and the increasing of minimum wage is putting pressure on businesses. Businesses are struggling. I've, I train thousands of businesses and there are business owners that are concerned about employing people. The minimum wage is skyrocketing, which then is going to affect people's pricing, which is... A, Let's is, just go back yeah. to the right to disconnect. Uh, yeah. I think, what I think about this is I don't feel so strongly about the right to disconnect because I do think people have a right to their own life and to not be harassed outside of work. But that does depend on them actually going to work and doing the job that they're meant to do. Oh, so I have, yeah, I kind of agree with Rene on this because I think it's about creating a happy medium. I'm sort of my personally of the view that I, I like being in the office and I think especially for more junior colleagues, the 
the way COVID and the way we've shifted to a lot of areas just being digitally in these kind of mm. meetings, mm. it takes a huge amount of strain because you, what would become a two minute chat of, oh, can you just show me how to do that yeah. in the computer? Oh yeah, come here, I'll, I'll show you how it's done. Oh. Is now, oh, let me schedule in a Zoom meeting with you so I can show okay. you how to do this. So this no, no one on wants that, but hang on, hang on. Yeah. In terms of the right to disconnect, I think it, there has to be a medium with that because in previous generations, you didn't have the technology of a boss WhatsApping you. You didn't. You, you used to have landlines, and it would be a very rare thing for a boss to call your home on a landline. It'd have to be a real emergency. So mm. it's about reapplying that. And I think, you know, this is something that's been tried and tested in a lot of other European countries, like Ireland, where there's a kind of reasonableness of saying, "Look, I might not get back to you because I'm off, and I'm entitled to my time off." And I think it's finding that happy medium. Where well, some businesses it's, it's can't an employee market, people. though. Let me tell you, it's an employee market. And if you are a, a, a mad boss that is mentally going after your people outside of hours, they ain't going to work for you anyway. That's the reality. Well, but I'm if you so need a little bit of just information that is critical to a small business in a moment, when you have a small business, you have 10 people running a business, each person retains information that is critical to the running of that business. If that person is uncontactable, it creates a massive strain on a small business so I think that if you put a rule in that says that you can't do that um, then that is a that's a real issue for a business owner but I think business owners generally should be respectful of their employees time ah, and build a good culture I right. agree with that. yes and I think David what this was doing Labour's plans actually was taking us to the same kind of employment scenario that France have and basically in France you can never fire anyone it doesn't matter oh, how yeah. useless they are it's <laughs> jobs for life what that does is yeah. it gets rid of a meritocracy okay. because people don't need to try no, exactly. and actually that's terrifying but isn't France a stronger economy than ours um, I'll have to check that. Yeah, I I'd think have it to is check that. just, but I think it is. But I, look, I, I was going to say we're pretty much on parity, yeah. in fact. But I think, look, I think it's. But you can't put that down to but, one but, thing. But, but, you can't put that down to one thing. But, yeah. then, but hang on a minute. There's the point. So, so particularly, I'm freelance, right? So everyone contacts me the whole this, time. Yeah. So, and I've run a small business, yeah. and I totally agree with what you say. But actually, this doesn't necessarily need legislation, does it? It needs respect. I that think where, where there are very good business owners and people that do take those into account, that's fine. You probably don't need it, but there will always be people who exploit. But I and think will always people will vote with their feet. Okay, right. and then, but, then but Lauren, is this not like risk in the world? You know, we're trying now to legislate for yeah, everything exactly. and take risk out of everybody's but there has to be, life. I think there you has can't. to be, but there has to be, especially when it comes to an important area like employment, there has to be basic levels of protection. And where bosses are there's, seen there's to not provide basic it, levels of protection well, but there right isn't now. when people there's huge amounts of protection but when they they want to increase and Labour want to focus on this area. Yes, the, you, the party you, of workers wants to focus on workers' rights. Well, right, you're already running a business. It is difficult enough when you're bringing employees in. There's a lot of small business owners that are terrified to employ people, terrified, yeah. which then stops the economy growing and putting more of these rules in place just makes terrified you suffer more. Terrified to employ young yeah. women? Yeah, yeah. Okay. totally. I'm going to pause it there. I just want to ask you very quick, quickly on the back of Jonathan Ross revealing he sometimes yeah. showers less than oh. once a week. Uh, how often should anyone shower? I read this. Apparently, Jonathan Ross doesn't shower. He actually showers less than once a week. Oh, uh, his his wife, Jane Goldman, the scriptwriter, also goes for days without showering. He went for two weeks without washing in the US oh. because wait for this Rene he'd been in a swimming pool mm. how often should, <laughs> how often should you shower I, I think that's someone's personal choice I shower twice a day, twice a day is what I shower oh, but yeah. it's yeah. up to, so up to go, what especially people especially if you're in do. London and you sort of go in and come back and don't want the tube in your bed sheets no, I think you should shower, shower we're, we're agreeing wash. on this yeah. anyway yeah, right? shower or wash every day I don't think it has to be either. I think and I, twice a day I think it's silly. Twice a day moisturiser is my, my view. <laughs> right. Uh, on that note, thank you very much, you clean bunch. Um, <laughs> that was today's Head to Head. Oh. Head to Head.